All right, friends. Um, let's see if we can get started on class 103. Uh, this class will, we're going to take our time because this is, we're still in the introductory phases of this sequence. And so far as my trying to inform you of what tools we can use to decipher uh, more accurately with the meaning in scripture, uh, particularly uh, scripture that is poetic and most scripture is to some extent, or at least has different levels of meaning and almost, almost always uses symbols. So uh, the slides I have tonight are, are probably gonna be longer in length than we'll be able to cover in this one class. So we'll probably just stop when uh, uh, it's necessary to do so in about 45 minutes. And then we'll pick up with the uh, uh, same uh, slides where we leave off tonight. We'll pick up next time. So uh, let me uh, begin by sharing my screen and why the po prophets are poets um and the same question really uh is what we mean by why is there indirection? This is something we discussed throughout the first hundred <laughs> classes about the fact that God in teaching us uses an indirect teaching methodology. And as I told you a long time ago, when I became a Baha'i and, and when I became a professor and I started thinking, well, if Baha'u'llah is the perfect teacher, which we believe him, believe him to be, uh, then his methodology must be the perfect teaching methodology. And what I discerned was that his methodology, like that of most of the manifestations, is largely indirect, as is God's plan. Um, if you read, those of you in the United States, read the feast letter for this feast that we are we just had yesterday, uh, then you, uh, the quote from the House of Justice letter, uh, I think it was 2019, uh, about uh, how dire things seem. And anybody with good sense, you would think, would uh, derive from that, that things are going to be a catastrophic, uh, end up with a catastrophic ending to planet Earth. And yet as Baha'is, we are or should be sublimely optimistic because we know that ultimately this will bring about uh, the lesser peace once that the nations of the world and particularly the rulers of those nations realize there's no other option left. So indirection is what is behind the use of poetic language, basically, why the poets, why the prophets are poets. Well, because it's a good way to do a number of things that indirect teaching accomplishes. The first of those is that poetic language explains what you do, don't know in terms of what you do know. Uh, and so uh, particularly this uh, deals with abstraction uh, and so on, but it, but it can even get down to physical things. If you haven't been to a physical uh, uh, environment, uh, say, then you can only explain it to someone in terms of environments that they have experienced. Uh, I think you understand what that means. Uh, secondly, uh, it, it describes, and this is a similar uh, value of using poetic language or indirect language, it describes the unfamiliar in terms of the familiar. Uh, and so uh, when Baha'u'llah is talking about the intoxicating effect of spiritual enlightenment, he often uses the, the wine, the image of wine and being intoxicated and drunk with uh, glee and with uh, uh, 
impassioned, as it were. And that, that's another analogy. Uh, the love relationship, for example, in the Seven Valleys, uh, the seeker uh, is seeking after his or her beloved. Uh, portrays the abstract in terms of the concrete. And there again, you, you it's hard to describe abstractions directly. And so you compare them to uh, concrete experiences. And here again, the, the intoxication of wine is, uh, is used to compare the intoxication of being in love. Uh, the, that same analogy works well. Uh, it conveys the spiritual in terms of the physical. So that's really just a, another way of stating the previous one, because spirituality is abstract. Uh, and we explain it in terms of physical laws and principles. So particularly uh, know that uh, we know how Baha Abdul Baha talks about the law of love as the organizing force of the spiritual realm, even as magnetism or magnetic force is the organizing force of the physical reality. So, uh, uh, and he also says, of course, that, that phrase I often uh, turn to about uh, each reality, physical reality and uh, spiritual reality are the exact counterparts of each other. And therefore we can understand each in terms of the other. So we can understand a spiritual law in terms of a physical principle. Uh, I remember one my brother used to like a lot was that we don't break the laws of God. We break ourselves on the laws of God because the laws of God aren't just exhortations. They are descriptions of reality. Uh, and so if you are unjust, you will reap the consequences not because of uh, some spiritual uh, assessment of your deeds in which you will be allotted a certain punishment, but because uh, injustice is impractical, it's illogical, it's irrational, it doesn't work. And so ultimately we turn to justice because it is, it is the most logical way to organize our lives. It compresses an, a concept, an entire concept into a single word or phrase or symbol. Uh, and so we talk about, uh, we mentioned last week, the lot, divine lot tree uh, and all kinds of symbols in the faith and in the other religions, the uh, burning bush. Well, all you have to do is mention that and it conjures up the whole episode where uh, Moses speaks with God. Um, and so it, it, that's one uh, important value of poetic language. It, it, it can, especially once you've studied it and see all the levels of meaning, and you don't have to go through that process again. Once you've got it, as you read through a passage, uh, the divine lot tree or the uh, uh, burning bush and so on, it, your mind takes all that in, immediately goes through those various levels. Very important, uh, again, in so far as why indirection is a valuable teaching technique, is that it invites the reader or student to participate, to take part in the creative act of understanding. So rather than just saying, here's what this means, and believe me, there, there are many teachers, as I said last class, who uh, instead of teaching how a poem works, simply say, here's what the poem means and let me show you how it, how it works. Now, what you really want is to instill in the students the capacity to achieve that understanding on their own. And this is what the scriptures want from us as well, for us to uh, um, grasp the meaning by delving into the relationship between the symbols, the metaphors, the analogies, and what the manifestation is saying to us. Another effective aspect of the poetic language, and this is kind of secondary in a sense, and yet because of the beauty of intoning the verses, and we, we hear that, of course, as we said before, when especially when someone chants the verse in uh, in the original language in English or in uh, 
I mean, in Persian or in Arabic, are there, there are now I'm finding some very fine uh, you know, singing groups online, Baha'i singing groups that uh, simply uh, put the uh, a verse from scripture into uh, a lyric form and do some beautiful things with it. Um, and of course, uh, we are uh, admonished to intone the verses ourselves. Uh, poetic language provides various levels of meaning rather than just a single interpretation. So, which is, by the way, and I didn't put this in, and I should have, it, this means that uh, poetic language is a protection against those who would presume to give some authoritative final interpretation of a verse. And of course, they cannot do it authoritatively anyway, but if they try to say, no, you're wrong, here's what it means, well, of course, you can both be right about the interpretation. And, well, I did put it in, by golly. It becomes a deterrent to dogmatism and authoritarianism. So where you had, uh, in all of the previous religions, uh, scholars or clerics uh, who would, uh, or divines, who would presume to give you a dogmatic interpretation, particularly when it came to law. And you have that, of course, in Judaism. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the uh, the series, The Chosen, which is on uh, angelstudios.com. But it's very well done in many respects. One of them is it shows, it gives you a really good look of the uh, Jewish uh, context of Jewish law and authoritarianism uh, into which Christ uh the advent of Christ occurred. Uh, poetic language enjoins all readers to become their own scholars rather than relying on the opinions of others. And this is sort of a repetition of what I've said. And it also is a reminder of the first uh, Arabic hidden word that, uh, that this is one definition of true justice is that you rely on your own understanding and not that of your neighbors. The, this idea of the poetic or figurative nature of scripture is discussed in my book, uh, The Ocean of His Words, in chapter five, for those of you who are interested. Uh, but most of what is in that chapter we're going to discuss uh, or we're going to be begin discussing tonight. Uh, so what are some of the important uh, keys or figures of speech uh, that uh, are part of poetic language or poetic verse? Uh, a symbol. Uh, now, one thing, uh, let me say up front, uh, we're going to look at a lot of definitions. Don't think you can get these all down in one sitting. Uh, you can't, nor can I explain them sufficiently well in one sitting. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go over them, mention them, show a few examples of them. We've already done that a little bit. And then what we're going to do is tackle different verses, some of which I hope you will suggest you would like to see us deal with, and, and we're going to be sort of a team uh, and employ these tools. So what we're trying to do is look at what are the tools that will help us uncover the veiled meaning or hidden meaning or levels of meaning in Scripture. So the most prominent one, I guess, well, these aren't in some sort of uh, um, sorted order. They're just uh, as they came to me. But one of the most important ones is a symbol, a thing that represents or stands for something else, especially material object representing something that's abstract. An example would be the divine lote tree, which symbolizes or alludes to Baha'u'llah. And of course, it also alludes to, in some cases, some of the other manifestations. The metaphor, what is a metaphor? Well, a metaphor is an object or action which is implicitly likened to another object or action that is essentially, and that should be L-Y, essentially different from 
the object that is being compared. So in other words, it is an implicit comparison as opposed to a simile, which is explicit. So the, it's not stated as a comparison, but you know it is. So, for example, when Baha'u'llah say he is, says he is the divine physician uh, for this age, uh, he doesn't say, I am like a divine. He says, I am the divine physician, but it's an implicit comparison uh, and a very fine one. And of course, he has the remedy for the ills of this age as a physician. A simile is the same thing, only it's explicit. Now, the key to both of these is that you're comparing essentially unlike things. Uh, so if I say uh, 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 Baha'u'llah is like Christ, that's not a metaphor or a, sim or a simile. Uh, that's simply a, a comparison. Uh, but if I say Baha'u'llah is like a physician, then that is a simile. So the revelation of Baha'u'llah is like a vast ocean. Or if we wanted to follow up on this previous example, Baha'u'llah's revelation is like a, a physician's remedy for the ills of an age. Personification. Oh, what is personification? Well, this is where an object or a force is described in terms of a human being or as possessing human characteristics. Uh, for example, the evil whisperer who whispers in men's breast. This is a verse from uh, a prayer, uh, and it's capitalized because you, you do capitalize personifications. It doesn't mean that there really is an, a being who's the evil whisperer, a Satan. Uh, it simply means this is a personification of the concept uh, of that longing that we have in our in ourselves to do that which is best for us and usually at the sacrifice of what is best for everyone but particularly what is best for ourselves and so the evil whisper would be the temptation to gamble or uh, or violate any of the laws which deter us from doing those things that are harmful to us a persona is different from a personification. This is a case, and I, we mentioned this last time, where the speaker is not the author, but a character that the author has created to narrate the thing. So in other words, when we looked at the 23rd Psalm in the last class, the speaker is not David or whoever composed the Psalm. It is the personification of a sheep. Um, I love thy creation, hence I created the, the therefore, wherefore do thou love me that I may name thy name and fill thy spirit, fill thy soul with the spirit of life. This is uh, Baha'u'llah writing, but it is in the voice, the persona of God. Uh, now, it's not the best example of persona because that could be said of everything Baha'u'llah says, that he's always speaking with the voice and authority of uh, the creator. But this is pretty explicit. This, this is, in effect, a reiteration of what is called the Hadith of the Hidden Treasure. Why does God create anything at all? Well, he creates that he might be known. And so if you look in the notes of the Kitabi Agnas, you'll see a very lengthy and very bountiful expression, I mean, description of that hidden treasure, uh, of the Hadith of the hidden treasure, and some examples in the writings of Baha'u'llah where he uh, reiterates that concept. Why does God create us so that we may be able to benefit by uh, having a love relationship with God? Uh, analogy, a comparison between a rela or a relationship between two actions or objects and a relationship between other actions or objects. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you uh, read this verse, little wonder then if the treatment prescribed by the physician in this day should not be found to be identical with that which he prescribed before. 
what he's saying is that, that because conditions change from age to age, we should not be perplexed if the laws of Baha'u'llah are different from those of Muhammad, or in the case of Christ, that he prescribes different laws uh, from those of the Judaic uh, legal uh, la uh, laws of the Judaic uh, religion. Allegory. What is an allegory? An allegory is a parable or a narrative in which the characters and actions have a hidden meaning in which they represent or allude to other persons or actions. And one of the best uh, examples I, I always use in explaining this is the little anecdote uh, that occurs in the Seven Valleys, where it's explaining that true knowledge is knowing the end in the beginning. So the valley of knowledge is explained in terms of a lover who sighed for long years in separation from his beloved and wasted in the fire of remoteness. From the rule of love, his breast was void of patience and his body weary of his spirit. He reckoned life without her as a mockery and the world consumed him away. And so here the lover is the seeker. The beloved would be nearness to God. And again, these are not authoritative interpretations. This is just one way of looking at it. And the narrative is discussing the search for attaining that longed-for nearness. So the watchman, as he runs tr trying to get away from or find his beloved, but he's finding this, what he thinks is uh, an evil spirit chasing him down this alleyway, and the watchmen prevent him from going into various exits. Uh, uh, one interpretation of these watchmen would be the laws that bar us from choosing, making wrong choices as we're trying to find the beloved. And then he leaps over the wall uh, and where he finds his beloved, and that might be a, a leap of faith a term that's used a lot in the, the Protestant religion. So those are some of them. They're not all of them. If you look up the term figures of speech or rhetor uh, rhetorical devices, you can find many, many, many others. But these are the principal ones that we will use. We will bring others in later. So we want to begin by understanding very specifically how these things work so that we can use them as tools uh, and experiment with them up front. And then we will uh, co uh, combine them all as we go through a verse and try to see which ones we can find. So let's begin with uh, what's called a Venn diagram uh, or set theory where we explain what is a metaphor. Uh, and these terms uh, may sound unfamiliar and somewhat academic, but there's not any terms that are much better. But uh, let me explain what they mean. Again, a metaphor is an implicit comparison between two essentially different things. So the tenor is the thing you are trying to describe. So let's say this is the manifestation. The vehicle is, as the term might imply, the comparison of this thing, Baha'u'llah in this case, to something that is essentially different in nature. So we say physician or nightingale or so on. But let's say, let's stick with physician. The meaning is what these essentially different things have in common. And so the meaning is the physician tries to cure the patient, the ills of the patient, and Baha'u'llah as a manifestation tries to cure the ills of humankind. So the meaning is what these essentially different things have in common. Uh, so the tenor, what is being described, the vehicle, what it is compared to and the meaning, what the essentially different things have in common. What do these two things have in common? 
so let's uh, take an example of the metaphor from the writings. In this case, we'll use the perfect mirror analogy. The manifestation is like a perfect mirror. How are they alike? Uh, and, of course, the uh, usual explanation is that the manifestation perfectly reflects the attributes of God, whereas we can reflect the attributes of God. He does so flawlessly. And so the meaning uh, is that while we have the ability to manifest all the attributes of God, uh, we never will do it perfectly. We'll never do a single attribute perfectly. The manifestation does all of them, manifests all of them, and does so flawlessly. And so that's the meaning. Uh, now, of course, the, the same terms that we use in explaining the metaphor work for a simile, too. Uh, but it's just explicit. Uh, now we go to symbols. What is the difference between a symbol and a metaphor? Well, sometimes a metaphor can become a symbol. But not always. And so there is a difference. And that is a symbol uh, uh, goes directly to the meaning. So again, using the uh, analogy, or not the analogy, using the symbol of a stop sign, the stop sign means stop. Uh, and you don't have to uh, wonder what it means in that case. You don't have to figure it out. It goes directly to the meaning. But there is a third aspect uh, in symbols of analyzing, and that is how do they come to mean what they do? Uh, for example, the flag represents a country. Now, notice the difference between this and a metaphor or simile. You're not saying the flag is like the country or the flag is the country. The flag symbolizes the country in some way. And of course, with the American flag, the stars represent the, the, uh, the uh, states. The bars represent the colonies, the original colonies. Um, and so when you find out how the symbol means what it means, then you are discovering what is called the, the you are recovering the illusion. So the term alludes or alludes to is very important. The symbol refers to or alludes to something. And you want to find out a lot of times, well, why? Why does it? Um, Of course, ultimately, all words are symbolic. I mean, a word is not a thing. It's just a, 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 a gathering of certain sounds or letters uh, that re represent the sound. So the sound comes first. The language comes first. Uh, interestingly, and this is important to know, and we'll discuss this more in another class, Poetry is the first form of literature that emerges in a culture. And I'm talking about as early as early tribal cultures, uh, because it was chanted usually collectively or told in stories around the fire in the evening. The stories would usually about be about the history of the tribe and its heroes. And that's how the stories, the histories were passed on. Probably much of the Old Testament was carried on in what's called the oral tradition or the oral formulaic tradition. Uh, this is something that we as Baha'is need to uh, do as well. The Guardian was very insistent that communities keep records of their own history because in the future, while you may think that you're a member of a very insignificant LSA in an insignificant village or something. When that village has hundreds and thousands and millions of people, they'll want to know, well, who started this? Who, who To whom are we indebted for uh, beginning this? So here, tree symboli, the word tree is a symbol of this thing. It is not this thing, nor is it like this thing. And so how did it come to be this thing? Well, there you get, as I said last time, into the science or the uh, uh, 
uh, the study of etymology, the origin of words. And that's a very fascinating thing to get into. Uh, the special place of the English language we discussed last time. Shoghi Effendi chose to do authoritative translations in English. Uh, and we'll discuss his background later about uh, how he did this and where he did this. The present authoritative translations are best on, based on his style and specific word choice. Now, what I'm talking about here is that, as I said before, he chose the eloquence and beauty, which he felt was a lasting beauty, even as the architecture of the world center is based on a classical tradition, although it's a, a very creative take on it. It is still has the columns and so forth that um, call to mind the classical tradition because it's an enduring tradition. Well, he felt the same thing was true about the Elizabethan English of Shakespeare. That uh, And so he uses these archaic forms, the these, the vows, and so on. Um, and when, and I've said this before, but worth saying again, present authoritative translations are best on his style and specific word choice. What I mean is that the uh, resources at the World Center have put together uh, a program where if you come across a word in Persian or Arabic and you want to know how the Guardian translated it, uh, you can look at that uh, if you are working at the World Center. I have not, but uh, and and it will pull up all the different places where the Guardian translated this word and what English words he chose and in what context to represent that word. The House of Justice looks to the English translation of Shoghi Effendi when making decisions based on the sacred text. Again, we mentioned that before. Shoghi Effendi specifically chose the Elizabethan style because of the classical beauty of the King James translation of the Bible. And I said the same idea behind the architecture. The English language, as we said last time, is extremely rich. Uh, by that, we mean how many synonyms you'll have for a particular idea or concept or th object, and thus can furnish precisely the right sense of nuanced words and concepts from the original Persian and Arabic. Uh, you have lots of choices, and of course this is the value of uh, the thesaurus, uh, which is very helpful when you're trying to emulate or translate the uh, works of the Baha'i writings. Uh, figures of speech called kinnings, or these were metaphors uh, used back in the earliest form of English language. English language dates from around the fourth century when it became a distinctly different language from the uh, Scandinavian languages from which it derived, uh, West Germanic languages from which it derived. And so in uh, the, uh, the the what's called Anglo-Saxon or Old English language, the earliest form of the English language, uh, because it was not rich at the time, it would use compounds to and poetic compounds to represent uh, uh, objects, concepts, and so on. So the sun is called Helfenes Jim are the gem of heaven. Uh, the sea was called Svanrada, or swan's road. The uh, human body was called Banhus, or the, the house, the bone house that contains the human body. Uh, a sword was called Bedo Lima, which Bedo is battle and Lima, light or flame really. Uh, so the flames of battle. The, a ship was called a uh, and uh, that which flows over in way can be way or it can be a uh, wave. So that which floats over the waves. The uh, Helfajima, I love this one, is the eye, which is the the gem or uh, of the uh, of the head the gems of the head, isn't that beautiful? 
so that you can see how poetic. Yes, uh, uh, Sherry, you have a, a comment or a question. Yes, please, John. So the root of these words, is it German? Is it Scandinavian? Is it from the Vikings? What is that? Uh, it, oh. The Anglo-Saxon language is, is a synthesis of about three different languages, Frisian, Franconian, uh, uh, but it's in the West German group. So it becomes by the fourth century its own language, but it is it's similar to about three different languages. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, this is the uh, the poet what poetry looked like fifteen hundred years ago in English. This is from the very famous work Beowulf, uh, and you can see it doesn't have a rhyme scheme, but it does have a meter. Uh, and uh, it and it does have uh, what's what's called alliterative verse. So uh, I won't try to explain it; it would be too complicated. But it goes like this: What way gardena in yerdagum fair king of rum you frunan, how the aisling us elin fremadon, off shield shaping shaith and a threatum. Monigum meth and metzele ofto ed sola erlas. Uh, this is uh, talking about shield shaping, uh, and it's what, which in, in, for our purposes just simply means low or by golly. <laughs> we, and then you go to the verb, have heard about in days of yore, yer daugum. Uh, uh, about the Feod, which means people or nation, uh, the kings of the tribes or nations, how the Aetling, an Aetling is a nobleman or a warrior, how the warriors perform deeds of valor, Fremel and Aelin. Oft shield shaping, shaitana, threatum, monogam, oft shield shaping would overtake the Medsetla which is the seats in the mead hall. That is, he would capture the, the mead hall was essentially the, the main gathering place of the tribe uh, uh, the, and defeat the earls. And yes, Sherry, you've got another question, Mark. John, how do you read this so eloquently, so amazing? Because I taught it for 43 years. Like this whole other language, right? Yes, it is. Like, it's it's a an entirely language. different language, and it's very difficult to learn, and uh, wow. um, and very more difficult to teach. That's uh, amazing how you do that. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> all right, and so the English language uh, changes. You can see these have particular word endings, uh, but that drops the word endings uh, around the. Uh, uh, once the French take over England around, of course, the Battle of, ten, of uh, 1066, when uh, William the Conqueror conquered uh, Harold, King of, of England. Uh, and so this is what the language looked like 700 years ago. Now, this is from Chaucer. This is called Middle English. So there are three stages in the uh, evolution of the English language. This is the second stage. The first one then lasted from around uh, the fourth century AD, and then it began to change in form so that this incorporates a lot of French, uh, borrowed words from French, and also it has lost the, uh, the um, endings the, uh, um, on the verbs and, and on the nouns. One that operated with his surest suit, the drought of March had pierced to the root and vathered every vine and sweet liqueur, of which vertu engendred is the fluid. When Zephyrus ache with his sweet a breath and spirit hath in every halt and haith, the tindra cropies and the young sun hath in the ram his halve corseron, and smaller follies mocking melodia that sleep in all the nicht with open ear. Now, this is actually only part of a sentence. It's the introductory uh, subordinate clause. When all this happens, uh, 
Mrs. Chaucer from the very first, the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, when all this happens, when spring comes, people like to go on pilgrimage, he goes on to say. Uh, so in, in, in translation, this is pretty easy to translate. When April, with its sweet showers, hath pierced to the root the drought of March and bathed in, uh, in sweet liqueur every vein of the trees and roots, of which vertu and genre is the fleur, from which force the flower is engendered, when Zephyrus, the wind, uh, also with his sweet breath, hath inspired every holt, every uh, uh, hill and vale, the tender crops and the young sun, hath in the ram his half course run. This is talking uh, astrologically about uh, the onset of spring. And small birds, fowls, make melody that sleep all the night with their eyes open. Then long and folk to gone on pilgrimage and then do folks long to go on pilgrimage. So uh, those are some of the, uh, uh, the, the things you, you might want to know about this language we're looking at uh, through the eyes of poetry uh, that uh, the Guardian chose to make the principal means by which we can understand what is written in uh, Persian and in Arabic, uh, though they are beauteous and valuable in their own. And so uh, I thought as an experiment, and we've, we've looked at this briefly before, but what's uh, interesting, of course, in one sense, is that uh, this experiment with the parable of the sower, which is one Christ used, when his um, own followers say, why, why do you use parables? Why don't you just speak directly when these people, when these scribes and Pharisees ask you questions? And his answer was because you understand the spiritual uh, nature of what I'm saying. They are legalistic. They don't get it. And so basically he is implying, I am forcing them to understand this by giving them a puzzle, an analogy. And those who get it uh, will benefit therefrom. Those who don't will be barred from understanding. And what's important about this particular parable, the parable of the sore, is that Christ himself deciphers it. He explains what it means so we can guess what it means, but then he gives us an authoritative interpretation. So this is from Matthew 13. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went to sow. And there's talking here about a, a, someone who's sowing seeds to grow a crop. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they spring, sprang up, sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Whoso hath ears, let him hear. Let to hear, let him hear. And this is referring to a, a passage from Isaiah where he says, the people's hearts are hard and their ears are, are filled with um, with wax and they can't hear, that, nor do they understand. So there are four places then that the seeds are sown, some by the wayside of the path, some in stony places, some among thorns, and others into good ground. So that's the first thing. We know that the sower... Uh, it's the manifestation is Christ himself. The seeds are the words of Christ. And he's speaking to people of different capacities from different situations. 
and so what are these situations? Well, obviously, the good ground is someone who's receptive, who's ready to hear the word, and they bring fruit. And of course, the fruit in this case, Christ often compares his followers to workers in the vineyard. So does Abdul Baha. Uh, and of course, they bring forth the grape, which brings forth the wine. Uh, and that is the fruit of the of the vine uh, that they bring forth. And hence, the the idea of imbibing the wine at the Last Supper is, uh, he says, take this in remembrance of me. And there, it represents the sacrificial act of Christ giving His blood. But in other cases, it represents the spirit that flows through the believers. And so, what you can do. And we're getting close to an end here, so we'll pick this up next time. But let me just show you what we're going to do. We're going to take the vehicles of these metaphors and put them here, the tenors, the things we're really talking about here, and the meaning we're going to put here. Uh, now, in some cases, you will know the tenor, but not the vehicle. Some, in other words, in, in each poem or each verse, you will, you're will you trying to fill in what you do know and use it as sort of a wedge, if you will, or a, a leverage to pry out the meaning. Um, so we'll leave off here, uh, and we'll pick up here next time. Uh, and eventually once we've sort of experimented with these tools we will then take passages as i say i wish you would go ahead now uh over the next few weeks and send me via email uh passages uh our works but we would rather uh, begin small with uh, just some passages you would like to see us try to understand or explain now, of course, the first place you want to look, if, if it's available, is to the authoritative text. And we'll show you how to do that, too. Okay, friends, let me stop sharing for now. And uh, we will begin our Q&A.